Well, we are in part four of a series that we're calling The Art of Being Unordinary. And for those of you who might be joining us new, what we've been doing is taking a look at areas of life where culture tends to direct or encourage us to live a certain way or to think a certain way. And what we discovered in week one or what we talked about was this, that just because everyone is doing something a certain way doesn't mean that everyone should be doing it that way. And if you're a parent, this is something you come back to over and over again with your kids, right? If everyone would jump off a bridge, would you jump off it too, right? We, we talk about this with our children, but adults, I think sometimes we forget to tell ourselves that same thing, that just because the world, the culture at large thinks or does things a certain way, even for us as adults, doesn't mean that that's the best way or the right way. And so what we've done so far is looked at different areas of life where when Jesus changes your life, gives you eternity, becomes your Lord, that he also changes the way that you view things as you live out that new life. So we've looked at a few different topics already. In week one, we looked at how to be unordinary with how you view your schedule and your time. In week two, we looked at what that means for your work and career. Last week, we talked about an unordinary way to view and interact within relationships. This week, I have the fun opportunity to talk about an unordinary way to view wealth an unordinary, godly way to view the things that you have on this earth, your, your money, your material blessings. You know, there's a lot of different things that people ask or think about when it comes to wealth and money. But I would say one of the most common questions that people ask, it usually happens when you're in your younger years, but honestly, it doesn't go away forever or all the time, a very common question is this one. How do I get rich? Or how do I accumulate more? How do I get more? And the reason why I know that people ask this question a lot is because it's one that, that I've wrestled with in the past. Um, I also know it because if you Google books about getting rich, there is a ton of different books. I, I only listed about eight of them or so here on the screen. The, the Science of Getting Rich, Rich Habits, Think and Grow Rich. My, my favorite uh, title is the last one. Um, you're so money. Live rich, even when you're not. <laughs> Sounds like a good book to become bankrupt or something or to fool yourself, I guess. But this is something, this, this feeling of having more, this feeling of maybe someday considering that you're rich, something that all of us have wrestled with in one way or another, especially in such an affluent country as the United States of America. But as you consider that question that you've at times wrestled with, I have another question for you to think about. How much do you need in order to to consider yourself to be rich. Like, at what point, if this is the line for being rich, do you go from not rich to being rich? Have you thought about that question? You know when you graduate because they give you a diploma. You know when you finish a race because you cross the finish line. How do you know whether you got to that point of being rich. Well, there was a Gallup poll done a number of years ago trying to find what the common answer to this question of how do you know when you're rich or not might be. And they polled lots of different people, thousands, in different economic you know, areas and brackets. And it's interesting what they found. So as they looked through the numbers, the people that they polled that had an annual household income of $40,000 or less, when asked, how much would you need to think or feel rich? The average answer was around $75,000 a year household income. So 
when they took the people who were already in that bracket of $75,000 or less, all of them probably said, you know what? I feel rich, right? When they were asked that question, I, I, you know that it's probably, when they ask people who are $75,000 or less of household income, they said, well, in order for me to feel rich, I would need to make 150,000. You know where this is going, right? Because when they took the people who made a household income of $150,000 on average, for them it was, well, we need to make $300,000 or more. And it went on and on and on. Now, one uh, author I was reading had this kind of humorous statement. He said, when you look at polls like this, nobody's rich, but everyone knows someone who is. How does that work? So, what does it mean to be rich? <laughs> I uh, looked up the word in the online dictionary. Didn't help. To be rich, having abundant possessions and especially material wealth. So, what does abundance mean? How do you define that? I wonder if the Bible has some help for us. In the, in the first century, there was a pastor named Paul and he wrote a bunch of letters that are contained in the Bible. And one of the letters he wrote was to a young man named Timothy that he was mentoring. Uh, he was trying to, to teach him what it looked like uh, to follow Christ and hit on a bunch of different topics that Paul felt were important. One of the areas that Paul spent time talking about was wealth and money. And interestingly, not only did Paul think this important to talk with Timothy about, uh, but Jesus felt it was an important topic too. Uh, we've talked about this before, but more than three-fourths of Jesus' parables were all about a person's interaction with money and wealth. And you might be wondering, is that because Jesus wanted everyone to give everything to the church they attend? Um, the answer is no. And in fact, I think it's helpful to remember that uh, if God wanted your stuff, he could just take it, right? He could. He has that power. It wasn't about necessarily giving to your church. Why Jesus was so passionate about this topic is because he understood that the thing that competes for first place in your heart more than any other thing are material blessings and wealth. It was true 4,000 years ago. That was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. So listen to how Paul writes to Timothy about rich. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, he writes, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And then pause, period, new thought. And those people that have more than food or clothing, those who want to get rich, those who have more than just what they need. Now, you, you read that first part first and you think, okay, if I have food and clothing, I'll be content with that. And your first reaction is, no, I won't. <laughs> what Paul is saying, Timothy, um, you should be. You could be. And, and then there's these other people that have more than just food and clothing. They are the people who want to get rich. Here's how Paul describes it. When you get rich, it's that point where you go from having only what you need for the day to having more than what you need for the day. That the baseline is having what you need. Anything more than that, God says, you're rich. And you know, it's interesting for thousands of years, that baseline made people really happy. Like, if I had a shelter to keep me dry from the rain, and I had some animal skin blankets to keep me warm when it's cold, and some clothes to keep me warm, and if I had enough food for today, and maybe a little bit for tomorrow already, and if I was nearby some um, clean water, like a river or a well. I mean, that's a good day. That is an amazing life. 
And yet something's changed, right, in our culture. Something's changed in us. But when it comes to the definition of rich, Paul comes back to this very simple way to understand it. It's our first fill-in for today. Rich is having more than you need. Do you have more than you need? Do you have more shoes that... I'm just going to pause right there. (laughs) You know, I I know some people. I might even uh, be one of them. uh, Potentially that have uh, so many clothes that you kind of have to pull them in and out of the closet seasonally because the closet or your drawers don't fit them all. I, I, know, I know some people that have so many clothes that they end up getting rid of a bunch, giving them away, only to uh, buy more to replace them uh, because they have so much. I, I know um, some people who have uh, so much uh, stuff in their attics or basements that they don't even know what's up there anymore because they have so much. We would, we would have to say, for the vast majority of us, we have more than we need. So I have some great news for you. This might be the best news you've ever heard at church. No, it's not, because Jesus is the best news. But you came here wondering, hopefully someday I'm rich. You're going to go home today saying, hey, baby, honey, we're rich. Let's go out to eat today. Celebrate the fact that God says we're rich. We have more than we need. You're rich. Now, I also recognize that there might be some listening to this message that don't have necessarily everything they need. And for that, I would say, please reach out to us as a church. We want to help. Um, We can connect you to the right people or the right organizations. Um, I know that on a day where you're hearing you're rich, not all of us are feeling that either because... Some of us, it's because of the uh, rising costs in our country and what we have doesn't buy as much as what it used to. I think a lot of times the reason why we don't feel rich is because as our money grows, so do the things that we purchase. So the margin is always so small that there's always this stress and there's debt because we are not necessarily wise with how much we spend. And as our gifts grow, so do the things that we buy or the houses that we purchase. But the reality is the vast majority of us today, we have more than we need. We may not have everything we want, but we have more than we need. We're, we're rich. So, The ordinary question in our culture that people ask about wealth is this, how do I get rich? The unordinary question that I'm asking all of us to think about is this question, how do I do a good job at being rich? How should I act and interact with what I have as someone who has more than I need? And that's what Paul continues with in his letter to Timothy. We're going to skip ahead to uh, towards the end of that chapter, verse 17. There's going to be three things we're going to look at today in how to be unordinary with our wealth. The first we find at the beginning. Paul writes, command those who are rich in this present world. He's being very clear. He's not talking about heavenly riches right now. He's talking about material blessings, rich in this present world. He commands them not to be arrogant, Do you know any arrogant rich people? Isn't that such a common thing? Like the more that people have or the more that you have, the smarter you think you are. And yet it's just the fact that we have more doesn't make us smarter. (laughs) You know, this was an issue 2,000 years ago. That's why Paul wrote about it. Even 1,000 years ago, I I came across this quote uh, from a a church father named uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. And he said, To see a man humble under prosperity is the greatest rarity in the world. You know, there's something that happens as we get more if we're not careful. All of a sudden, we begin to 
think that it's us, or we at least forget that it's not just us, and we become very focused on how we got there, or very focused on the things of this world, and it's very easy to become arrogant. Uh, In fact, before the children of Israel entered the promised land, remember they spent 40 years wandering in the desert, they had almost nothing. And then God, through some miracles, were going to allow the Israelites to conquer those who inhabited the, the promised land, Canaan. But before they did that, God, through Moses, was kind of getting ahead of things a little bit. Here's what he told them in Deuteronomy 8. You may say to yourself someday, when you have more, that it's my power and the strength of my hands that produced this wealth for me. And Moses says, but remember the Lord, your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. I, I know many of you, and I know how hard you work, and I know the talents you have. I know how dependable you are at your job, And it certainly is through the the skills and gifts and perseverance that you have that God has blessed you with the things that you have. But at the very same time, let's never forget that God is behind it. Because here's what I also know. There are some hardworking, dependable, talented people who have less than you. And there are some talented, dependable people who have more. How does that work? How does that all figure out? It, it's, it's God that's behind it. He's the one that, that gives us what we have. Here, here's another question. Um, how many of you chose to live in one of the, the wealthiest countries the world has ever seen? There might be a few of you that came through your choice, but the vast majority of you, your story is mine. I didn't have any choice. I was just blessed to be able to live here and to have, from a worldly perspective, more than most. What a, what a blessing we've been given by God. And so you know how to be unordinary with your wealth? There's the ordinary way to view things, but here's the unordinary way. First thing, that we work to replace arrogance with gratitude. That, that as, as unordinary wealthy people, rich people, that we live each day in the gratitude that God has given us more than what we deserve. We may not have everything we want, but we have more than we need, the vast majority of us. And if you feel that little like, you know, arrogance kind of coming up in you, I was thinking this week, what do we do about that? A couple things. One, Call it out in your mind and your heart when you're starting to feel that pride and just squash it. Remind yourself that God is the giver. The other thing that can help sort of, I would say, center you is in the morning. Just in your morning prayer, make it one filled with gratitude. Thank God for the things that you have. Start your day with the mindset that all the things that I have today, God is the giver of all good things. So first thing, being unordinary, replace arrogance with gratitude. Paul continues to Timothy. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in their wealth, which is why, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope instead in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, I wanted to pause here at the end part just for a moment. This is kind of a a side note, but it's in the lesson. I think sometimes um, Christians and sometimes churches uh, tend to accidentally give off this idea that Christians feel almost embarrassed if they have a lot And I want you to know, um, if you're embarrassed that you have a lot, then in a way, you've forgotten that God is the giver because he's the one that gave it to you. And isn't it cool to understand that God gave it to us for our enjoyment? Like, if God has, has given you much, I mean, there's a responsibility there that we'll talk about at the end today. 
But there's also this ability to enjoy it. He gave it to you for your enjoyment. And, and so if you're balanced in how you look at what you have, if what you have has not become an idol, if you are diligent with generosity, and then you can still afford another pair of shoes, God says, hey, go for it. I give you this for your enjoyment. If you're balanced in your generosity and, the, and what you have is not an idol and you want to buy a slightly larger TV, which um, I might have done in the last month or so, I'm preaching to myself. Enjoy it. God says that's okay. You can enjoy it. If you're balanced in what you have and decide to buy a boat, enjoy the boat. God wants you to enjoy the things that who gave, that he gave, right? But he tells us, though, don't put your hope in it. Another way to say this is, don't find your security for the future in how much money you've been able to accumulate or save. I want to unpack this for a moment because I don't want you to come away from the message today thinking that God is encouraging us not to save or not to think about retirement. He absolutely wants us to. But at the very same time, what he's telling us, what Paul is telling Timothy is more of a heart issue. When you think about the future, where does your greatest sense of financial security come from? Is it the size of your retirement or is it the size and power of your God? Now, save for retirement. I'm going to say that again, if you can. But where does your confidence come from? Solomon, one of the wisest men um, who ever lived, wrote this proverb that I think is really helpful in Proverbs 18. He wrote, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. What Solomon noticed as he viewed people a thousand years before Christ or so is that the rich people, the people who had more than they need, they found their security and their confidence. He called it their fortified city and how much they had. And then he goes on to say, they imagine it because it's not going to work. They imagine it because it can't do what they hope it can do. They imagine it a wall too high to scale in the sense that if I have this nest egg or if I have this money, everything's going to be fine. Let me ask you this question. How much do you need to save in order to be safe and secure from every single foreseeable thing that could happen in the future? Now, I did a little bit of digging into your bank accounts. And I know what that number is. Here's what it is. For every single one of you and me. Do you know that um, people who, I'll, I'll use the term poor, people that don't have much, they don't have as much of a hard time finding their security in the future in their stuff. Because they're living with gratitude for the things they have today. They, they don't have the ability to find security in their stuff. This is a, a rich person problem. And what Paul is telling Timothy, number three, is an unordinary way to view our wealth is to replace uncertainty with confidence. How? Well, let's go back to the verse. How do we do that? that instead of putting your hope in riches, put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You see, there's no amount of money that's going to be able to give you perfect confidence about the future. But we have a God who stays steady even when the stock market rises and falls. You have a provider, God, who's already given you everything that you have that doesn't change like the price of eggs or gas or inflation. We have a God who's there even when your job is not. 
And when you look throughout history, I just love all these examples that you can think of where God took care of his people. You think of the widow who had nothing to eat and God just continually made her jar filled with oil. You think of the children of Israel in the wilderness and for 40 years, God supplied bread and quail every single day. He allowed for their clothes for 40 years not to wear out. Now, they were woefully out of style, but they didn't wear out. God took care of his people. He's protected them. He doesn't always give us everything we want, but you can have every confidence about the future that he does not forget about you and that he's going to take care of you. Find your security, even in uncertain times, in the God who provides. That's how you be unordinary with what we have. We take care of what we have. We even save, but we find our confidence and security in the God who's provided what we have in the first place. And then someday, he even is going to give us more. Riches that last forever. Uh, thinking of uh, something that Peter, one of his disciples, wrote. Uh, this was a man who saw Jesus not only be crucified, but then also saw him alive again. And Peter wrote, he wrote, in God's great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he's also given us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. See, someday, the things that we think are so precious and valuable in this earth, um, not only will we not think they're precious and valuable anymore, but we won't need them because we won't be here. But the greatest thing that God has done for us is made us wealthy, rich people, not for this life, but for eternity, and has given us an inheritance that will never go away, that will never perish, spoil, or fade. In fact, you think of how Jesus, when he came to this earth, his pursuit, his mindset was so different. We as people tend to get consumed with getting rich. Jesus came to this earth with not only the mission, but being consumed by being poor for you. Consumed with how can I serve my people and ultimately die so that they might have riches that Jesus had this perfect attitude about life, that he trusted his heavenly father, and then he carried out the purpose that God gave him. And on the cross, we see someone who gave up the riches of heaven, who became poor, who gave up everything so that you and I, not only for this life, but more for eternity, might have everything we could ever want or need. We are so blessed. We have more than we need for this life. We have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. And so Paul has one more thing to share with Timothy. He says, command those rich people. Do you know any? Yeah, I thought so. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share and in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves. Now, I highlighted this because it can be kind of confusing. Paul's not saying that by doing good things, um, you're going to earn your way to heaven. He's saying when we are generous, it is a sign of faith. It is us living out our faith in response to what Jesus has done for us. They will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul says, you want to be an unordinary rich person? Do good. Be rich in good deeds and be generous. Do you know, in our culture, this is very unordinary. Statistically, people who have more are statistically less generous than people who have less. Now, they might give a larger number, but percentage of what they have, rich people give statistically far less, and yet they have far more. 
There is this temptation, I think, again, when you have to sort of hold on to and make it about ourselves. You want to be an unordinary rich person? Last thing, have a plan for giving, not just receiving. That, that one of the, the greatest ways that we can view the things that we have is how can we use it, Paul says to Timothy, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous. That we spend so much time with making plans for getting. What does it look like, rich people, if we all look at what is a plan for giving to an organization maybe that's doing good things, to your church, to, to people you know that are in need. How can we be generous, rich people? That's a way to be unordinary. I hope you understand what a big day this is today. You just found out that you're rich. What a blessing. You have more, most of us do, than what you need. Now the question is, how can we, in response to all that God has given to us. How can we not just be ordinary people, but how can we be unordinary with what we've been given? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, uh, we thank you for all of the many blessings that you've given to us. And we would ask that we view those as we should, gifts from your hand. And Lord, when we recognize that all that we have comes from you, well, it gives us confidence it gives us gratitude because you are going to continue to take care of us just like you always have. Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to consider what does it look like to be generous with what we have been given in response to all that you have given to us through Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.